Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the T3M podcast. It's your host, Fayad, with Rami and Angel. How's it going, guys? Chillin', brother. Alhamdulillah, Habibi. Yeah, so this is episode one, officially, on the YouTube podcast, and episode 999 of our usual calls. Uh, looking forward to uh, spreading some truth. Inshallah. So to begin, a question I have for you guys is why? Why do you live the way you live? Because generally, we always know that, okay, I'm doing this. Like we know the who, what, where, and when, right? I'm doing this. I know who I am. I know how I'm doing it. I know what I'm doing. I know when I'm doing it but we don't exactly know why. So generally, one question I have for you guys and everybody is, why do you live the way you live and how do you know that is correct? Because had you grown up in another country with different views on very specific issues, you would also have those same views. And if you were to take you from America, for example, and you from a tribe in, I don't know, deep uh, within some cultural African area, and you were to compare the two, they would highly disagree on many topics. So why do you guys think you live the way you live? Mm. I don't know. Take it away. Uh, well, I'm going to say that it's largely due to our upbringing and our environment. Because, bro, we are, we are a product of our, our nurture and our nature. And, you know, most people will say, ah, um, I am the way that I am, or this is why I do this. But it's like, that's not really them. That's just their nurture and their nature. And they wouldn't really know why, or they wouldn't really know who they really are unless they took that time out to themselves. And they just kind of disconnected from everything and just reconnected with God. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's, It's so much easier to become like your surroundings and be an agreeable person instead of standing out. And once you get into that slippery slope, it's easier to maintain something, which is like inertia, instead of changing who you are, taking the time to fix up bad habits, things you want to improve on, and become a newer version of yourself. Yeah. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. I'm in full agreement with that because with a lot of people, like you guys mentioned, they're a product of their surroundings, right? They're, they grow up a very specific way. And I would say that they're just a version of themselves. Like I mentioned in that comparison in the beginning, the same person in two different places, they would be two different people ultimately, but they're the same person in terms of, you know, every, everything else, right? Who, what, where, when, it's just like their morals and why they believe what they believe. That's the only thing that has changed. So now the question is, how do you know what, what's right? How do you know that you're right? Because there is basically moral objectivity, which objective truths. And then there's moral subjectivity, which is I believe this, I believe that with my limited bias and information and so on and so forth. So how would you guys kind of approach this topic of how do you know you're living the correct way? How do you go about living the correct way? Well, how would you or, see that? Mm, yeah, well, that's yeah. good. All right, well, pull a question back on me, sick. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I would say that moral objectivity can only come from a creator-like being, a god-like being, because every single human being is limited in information, and they have a bias regardless. Everybody has some kind of bias, whether they admit it or not, whether it's large or small, everybody has a bias, and everybody's definitely limited with their information so to get an objective truth you would have to know everything who's the only one that knows everything yeah. Allah God the creator yeah. so if you want objective truths especially with something like morality because if I if someone asked me to prove that murder is wrong how do I prove that it's wrong I can prove it doesn't help society I could prove that we would see it as a barbaric thing but to prove it is wrong you can't yeah. prove that so that's where yeah. subjectivity comes in Fayad? percent man if you, if you really think about it like subjective morality is just based on feelings what feels right and what feels wrong inherently to add to your point when you look at murder it occurs in nature right every day we don't look at it and say okay wow like that, there's something wrong with that 
But when it's with humans, we have that sense of, okay, right and wrong. But where does that come from? But there's other things that do occur in nature, which also occur in socialization in humans, but we think it's okay too, right? So you're right. Yeah, just to, just to kind of uh, back up the point there. When it comes to uh, something like murder, it's funny because you'll have the people that say, if you kill any living being, you're a murderer, right? But then when they want to protect themselves from COVID-19, so they put hand sanitizer on and they kill all the living bacteria on their hand, they would never call mm -hmm. themselves a murderer for that, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of funny when you're dealing with moral subjectivity, they always have these general rules like don't murder anything that, that's living, and then they kill all the bacteria and all of a sudden they're a murderer by their own standards. And then when you bring that to them, they're like, wait, no. So it's, it, this is the issue with not having all the information, but making a judgment. And this goes for everything in life, right? But speak on morality specifically. Uh... Facts. Well, I would go as far as to say that us knowing uh, like what's right and what's wrong, like that stems from our fitra. And like, y'all know what the fitra is. It's that innate belief in that right there, the creator, bro. So it's like, if you take away everything, if you strip away everything, like I was saying in my previous answer, like you are left with that fitra. And like, that's where you know what's true and like what's not true, what's right and what's not wrong because you are guided by something bigger than yourself. Yeah. That's facts, that's facts. Um, I would say- I just want to add to that, Tad, um, before you go on. So, yeah, we talked about subjective and objective, but I guess the viewers want to know what's wrong with subjective morality, you know? What's wrong with just going based off of your feelings and instincts? Before we talk about the problem, we got to realize, we got to identify in the grand scheme of things how it's maladaptive, how it's non-resourceful. You think of subjective morality, you think of it in the grand scheme. It's always changing. See, people, if you really think about it, the slave enslaving of you know African Americans was subjectively, morally considered okay back then. Couple you know hundred years later or you know decades later, they realize okay it's not okay. Which you know I agree with it's not okay. But the thing with subjective morality is you're wavering your beliefs. You can go back and forth. If the people in power and control deem something to be okay one day, it'll be okay one day. If five years later they realize it's not, it's not. And you kind of have to conform to that group thinking and follow that school of thought. There's no guideline and backbone in what is right, what is wrong. Yeah, subhanAllah. And that's actually uh, what I was just going to kind of dip into, like the issue with it. Because when we have something like the fitra, our innate belief and instinct and all of that, this works generally but not everybody listens to it, right? And some people become so misguided that that fitra becomes clouded in a sense. And this is the people that Allah basically left astray. So you'll have people who could be mentally ill and they could want to murder. And that could be a instinctive kind of, oh, I feel it, I want to commit murder, right? I really want to do this thing. And that might feel right to them. But then you have people that are like, no, that's under no circumstances, okay. And so not only do you have changing beliefs over time and over place, you have two people in the same exact room that grew up the same exact way. And one will say abortion is wrong. And the other will say abortion is right. How do you prove who is right, who is wrong? You cannot prove that. You can argue that, okay, giving birth to this baby would be detrimental, one, to the baby, to the, to the, um, uh, the mother, so on and so forth. You could say, but well, you're murdering an innocent life and so on and so forth. It's no longer your life. It's the child's life now. And you can take sides, you know, however you choose, but there's no way to prove it. So objective truth mm. must come from a creator. And that would just be through religion, ultimately. Facts. Facts. It's the guidelines. All right, let me play, let me play devil's advocate for one question. Because I know a lot of people might have this question. How do you know what objective truth is? All right, so because objective truth. We're speaking as subjective beings. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So are you talking about a, a religious person or a religious person? Why not both? All right. So from a religious standpoint, they would just follow the religion that they believe in, right? The religion they look at, is they say, this is the truth and, you know, emphasis on the truth, meaning it's from God. They would see this and say, the guidelines that come with this religion, the moral guidelines, and etiquettes that come from this religion, these are objectively true. Christians will say this about their religion. Muslims will definitely say this about Islam. We look at Islam and things like 
if you kill one soul, one innocent soul, it's as if you killed all of mankind. And then we have rulings that constitute who is an innocent person, who is not an innocent person, when it's okay, when it's completely haram, so on and so forth. So a Muslim will look at that and say, this is objectively true. The Quran and the Prophet, peace be upon him, say this and that. Therefore, they say we hear and we obey, right? Mm -hmm. But a subjective person with no religious views or values will look and say, I feel and I obey. And then the next person beside them will say, I feel and I obey. And then you have contradictions. But when you have majority of people on the same page when it comes to religious views, that is what we would identify as objectively true from God as objective morality. Mm. And you guys already know where the where the saying, uh, uh, if you kill one man, um, it's as if you killed all of mankind. Um, it came from the Quran. Do you guys know the story, right? I don't. No? All right, let me, let me remind you. So, you know about Adam, peace be upon him. He had two kids, right? Abel and, or at least he had his two first sons, Abel and Cain. So I believe that he, he gave them both um, some, t some type of test. And I, I believe it was Abel that passed the test and he was, he was given the blessings, but Cain wasn't. And because Cain wasn't given that, he, he had that spite in his heart and he killed his brother. And it was at that time, it was the first time that murder took place and unjust, anything unjust. It was, I think, the first sin that occurred in this dunya, in earth. And that's when Allah said, um, if you kill one man, it's as if you've killed all of mankind. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, man. From, I, actually, I didn't, I didn't know that that was the story associated with it. Um, this was actually, in like the full version of the Quran, what Allah mentions is that for this reason, I forgot what the reason was, but Allah says, for this reason, we ordained upon the children of Israel that mm. if you kill one soul, it's as if you killed all of mankind. If you save one soul, it's as if you saved all of mankind. And uh, this is because some people mention that it's in like some of the Jewish scriptures, that exact mm -hmm. verse. And people say we stole it, but the Quran mentions it as well. Just getting that out there. But yeah, subhanAllah, it's, um, it's amazing from the from the get-go Allah set that in place because it to us it would be it would seem like such a fundamental thing like murder is wrong right and mm -hmm. I'm sure um actually I believe there's narrations uh talking about he kind of felt a bit guilty afterwards or he didn't really know what to do and then Allah sent crows where one killed another and then buried him to show him that he should bury his brother afterwards subhanAllah mm -hmm. yep. but this is how Allah guides us right this is Allah showing us the best way to live and it's not just with morality, right? It's not just with beliefs. It's with actions as well, which is what I was going to get into next. And it's not just how do you know your beliefs are correct, right? We're not talking about cognitive dissonance where you believe one thing and you do another and then become depressed. We're, now we're talking about believing in a certain thing and now you're living in a certain way, right? You're not just saying this is true, this is moral, but now you're living in that way because now you're opening up a whole new spectrum of the physical world that can take good or bad physical manifestations. For example, I could choose that drinking is okay, therefore I will drink. Mm -hmm. And then I could harm myself. Or I could say fasting is obligatory, therefore I will fast. And then I go, I undergo all the healthy benefits of fasting. So what do you guys think about that? Well, before, before we even answer that, Rami, could you more simply explain uh, objective morality and subjective morality because you did a great job explaining it but i feel like for people who are watching this podcast yeah. and who don't i don't know and i'm trying to put myself in their shoes and the way that you explained it was it was great but it was a little complex could you put okay. it in a more simpler way all right inshallah i'll try so first i want to give an example an objective truth is something that is true no matter what. For example, one plus one equals two. You may, you actually would have trouble proving that one plus one equals two, but you know, fundamentally, objectively, it is true. You can go to Mars, it would be true. You can go to any part of the world, you can go under the ocean, you can go in the sky, it would be true no matter what. Any part of the galaxy, the universe, one plus one will always be two, right? But then you have things that, this is subjective morality, you have things that, I feel, I believe that this is okay, this is not okay, and this is something that no one can prove, right? This is something that is not objectively, fundamentally true, right? So if someone comes and says something like, well, I think abortion is fine, why wouldn't it be? 
you may not be able to prove that it's wrong to tell that person, no, you're wrong, abortion's wrong, but they wouldn't be able to prove that it's right either. So then you have this dispute where one side cannot prove the other side wrong because there's no fundamental basis. There's no rule book that they have. So what religion is, it's that rule book with the one plus one equals two. It's telling us what is true, what is false. So we have that objective, this is true point to make. Mm -hmm. So just to summarize it. Yeah, no, I'll let you finish. Just to summarize it, object, objectivity, objective truth is something like one plus one equals two. Mm-hmm. And subjective truth is, well, I think this, I think that, and you can't really prove it or prove against it. Mm-hmm. And the beauty with religion, and especially Islam, um, is the Quran gives you the scope of interpretation or inference. So it helps you strengthen your iman or belief. So things like where you were saying that, oh, uh, we have this, this ruling, this guidebook on this is right, this is wrong. Oftentimes, sometimes it leaves it at that, but other times it also explains why. And the times it doesn't explain why, you can put two and two together and come to a conclusion why it's right or wrong. But the times it, it explains why, it, it just it tells you just like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, subhanAllah, so just to add to that, actually, in Islam, you very rarely have a rule that is consistent no matter what. For example, the one, one of the rules that would be consistent no matter what is la ilaha illallah. You worship one God alone. <clears throat> Pardon me. You worship one God alone with no parties, no associates, nothing. Right? No matter what. Even if you're dying, you still, work, you still do that. Even if you're living your life, you still do that. But something like eating pork, it's haram. But if you're you know, starving in the middle of the desert or in the middle of nowhere and all there is is pork to eat, you're actually obligated to eat that pork. You're not allowed to say, it's haram, I'm going to die. You're obligated now to eat that pork. So mm-hmm. this is the beauty of Islam because everything is situational. And this is something that scholars go in depth on in a variety of uh, moral views and, and rulings, Islamic rulings. For example, the pig uh, rule, uh, example I just gave. Because if they had said that, okay, no, you must starve and die. Well, how is that beneficial? Because above not eating pork is maintaining your life and your livelihood. So I think that's the real beauty of the objective moral views in Islam. That was well put, by the way, simplifying it. Just go ahead. But, and listen. Faya, go ahead and answer the other question if you remember. If not, then Rami, by all means, reiterate yourself. Rami, take it away. <laughs> Done a roll, man. Let him shine. Wait, no, yeah, no, it's a conversation. It's not a lecture. No, no, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> saying like, if you remember yeah. what Fire was saying before I had interrupted and had asked him to uh, just put the objective and subjective into a more simple term. He has said something prior to that. Do you remember that? I don't. <laughs> what was it? I have no idea either. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm going to be honest. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> inshallah. So, um, yeah, inshallah, hopefully we'll find a way back to that, that point. But um, mm-hmm. actually, I mentioned before I had mentioned uh, actions, right, in comparison to, to moral views, right? Because you could have a moral view that manifests itself physically. Like I mentioned, I think drinking is okay, and then I go and drink because of that. Or mm-hmm. I think fasting is obligatory. I must do it. Therefore, I fast, and I get the benefits of fasting. So would you guys like to kind of back that up or give your thoughts on how important it is to have moral views that manifest physically or otherwise? Hey, Faya. So are you, brother. I'm going to let you go, bro. Nah. Hey, Rami, by the way, that was what you said. Yeah, so... Yo, you haven't, you haven't been speaking for a while. Alhamdulillah. Who? You. I'm just listening, man. <laughs> He's I'm listening. one of the viewers. I'm, I'm one of the viewers right now. <laughs> I mean, okay, what would you say, Anhil, what would you say um, one of the, the bigger things Islam has done for you? Because if, for those of you who don't know, our brother Anhil here, may Allah bless him, reverted very, very recently. So he wasn't a Muslim until a few weeks ago. May Allah bless him. But... um. 
so what would you say without getting into you know vast detail some of the greater impacts islam has had on you spiritually morally or otherwise yo to f- facilitate it then versus now thank you all right so uh very simply put before islam i was constantly trying to find my way i was trying to find uh, peace and i was doing everything possible that you could think of i mean i i had been to therapists i had been a psychologist um i had done tons of meditation i had been uh catholicism christianism if that's how you say it christian christianism um was atheist for a while then i went into the whole new age thing and guys the only way that i can put it is that islam was just like all right here it is like here's the path this is what you do and as long as you do it you're good and i find that most of the things that i was doing before like some of them are still beneficial like meditation i still do it every now and then just so i could be more aware of what's going on in my head uh cold showers for sure no fab for sure but no fab is already in islam like that's something <laughs> that it's already practiced like you, you're not supposed to do it so it's like i was already doing something that was in islam itself but um when i got into islam it just made it very simple for me it gave me it gave me a path and my grandpa used to always tell me he's like uh when you buy a new phone it comes with instruction manuals just like Bro, if I had, remember we were talking, you had said that when you get a bed frame from Ikea, it gives you the uh, the instruction manual on how to build that bed frame. And it's like, you could build the bed frame by yourself without the instruction manual. It's just going to take you a lot longer. You got to figure it out for yourself. But if you have the instruction manual right there, why not use it and finish it in a fraction of the time and do it perfectly because you have the instruction manual. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what Islam has done. Honestly, that's what Islam has done. So alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that guy building the bed frame might get frustrated and think, you, you're saying it might take him longer to get to that point where he, he finishes building the bed. Yeah. What if he doesn't? What if partway through, he just gets so frustrated. He thinks there's a problem with the bed, which oh, is facts. Seen a lot of irreligious and, you know, woke, spiritual, but irreligious people saying, Oh, you know, why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to good people? And they just, a lot of things just don't click. Whereas if you had the instruction manual, you'd understand where, where things are going. Yep, yep. Right. So, kind of long. so, or, bro, now go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to add on to that because I, I find it kind of funny to be honest. What if he puts the bed together incorrectly and then after a few months it breaks down? So, kind of long. Exactly. And then he, has this, he deems it correct, question. although it's objectively incorrect. So, kind of long. Right? Yo. So like Rami says, I'm going to piggyback off what both of y'all said. <laughs> I want to say a few years ago, uh, when I was with my ex, she had gotten a new bed frame from Ikea. All right, so it's funny that we're talking about this from Ikea. And man, this was one of those like stupidly complex bed frames. I'm not talking about the simple ones. This is the one that had like the drawers underneath. I don't know what they were trying to do with this, but me being the hard-headed stubborn person that I was I grabbed the instruction manual I tore it up and I said all right we're gonna do this without any instruction manual and we spent literally six hours six hours trying to make this thing and when we finally got it I was just like why did I do that why did I tear up the instruction manual and try to do this by myself when it took me six hours and like y'all said I could have messed it up we could have messed it up, but like referring it into a real life scenario, aside from the example, it's like, dude, I was doing all these things before I came on Islam. I was doing all these things before I had the instruction manual. And like, I didn't know if I was going left, if I was going right, if I was going forward, if I was going backwards, I was just trying to be at peace. I was trying to be happy. I was trying to, uh, I don't know. I was trying to find something greater to life, like a greater meaning or something. And it's like, dude, like, like you said, I may have never found that. 
you know, or maybe I would have, but maybe I would have fig- found it out, figured it out. Maybe like at the end of my life where it's like now, dude, I'm 26 years old and Alhamdulillah, like I found it. Or I, I wouldn't even say I found it. I was led to it. Mm. So, yo, two things I want to add to that. One, bro, the fact that it took you six hours to build an Ikea furniture piece without Ridiculous. the manual. I think that's impressive, bro, because I think Ikea's instruction manuals are just on some next whatever. So sometimes it takes people, including myself, six to eight hours to build it with the manual. (laughs) So that's commendable, bro, that it took you six hours. I think that's an achievement. Number two, you said you were led to Islam. What do you think... Because I know a lot of viewers are going to have a question about that. What do you mean led to? Don't you, are we individuals? Aren't we leading our lives? What is, what is this whole thing about let go and let God? What does it really mean? All right. So I'm going a, I'm to a try to explain this as simple as possible. And I, I'll try not to take too much time here. All right. So when, what it means to let go and let God is that you know, ultimately, we have our own decision. We can decide anything we want in this life, right? You wake up, you can decide whether you're going to brush your teeth, whether you're not going to brush your teeth. Now, obviously, if you don't brush your teeth, you're pretty nasty, all right? But you have the choice. You can brush them. You cannot brush them. Now, yes, you have a decision, and that's what you would refer to as free will, but you got to understand, like, this is all test this is all like a game and when you play a video game you you start playing this video game it's already been programmed by something it's it's, it was created by something right so the video game is the creation you are in this creation you are part of the creation or technically you know you're playing it and you can choose whatever you want in this game you can choose to let's say you have this person in front of you you can choose to help them or you can choose to kill them and rob them Right? Like whatever choice you make, the game is still going to unravel and go off in that direction. And that's how life is. So like whatever choice you make, that's what's going to happen in your life. And what it means to let go and let God is to basically quit trying to control everything. Quit trying to, uh, for lack of better words, be God. You know, it's like you start thinking to yourself, ah, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Uh, my life is going to go in this direction. I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to be making this much money. I'm going to be with this woman over here. I'm going to have these kids. I'm going to leave this legacy. I'm going to do all this. But it's like at that point, like you're just trying to play God. And it's funny because like before I got into Islam, there was a, a song by Travis Scott saying, stop trying to be God. But um, to get back on point, I, I agree. You're letting go, so you stop trying to control everything. And then once you stop trying to control everything and you disconnect yourself from everything, that's that's when God comes in and is like, all right, cool. Let me help you out. You know, let, I see, I, I see that you just you just let go. You just took a, a, a step aside. Let me let me step in now, now that you want to step mm-hmm. aside. And um mm-hmm. I'll share my story if y'all want, but let me not take the spotlight. Y'all go ahead, chime in. <laughs> Subhanallah, bro. Allah. It, that was that was amazing. May Allah bless you. But um, there's a few things I want to piggyback off that point. So, uh, <laughs> Subhanallah. Actually, what came to mind when he said that was the verse in the Quran where Allah says, "Have you seen the one who has taken his own desires as his own god?" Subhanallah. Mm. And that that's exactly kind of what you were talking about, right? And what I see is a person, in the person you described, right? Letting go and, and kind of not taking charge anymore and letting God do the work. This is the person who has submitted to Allah. This is the person who has become humble. I, I know, I realize now this bed is too hard for me to put together. I'm going to leave it up to Allah. And then that's when Allah guides who he wills, right? When Allah says mm-hmm. that he guides who he wills, it's not just like, okay, you get guided and no, you don't get guided. And there's no reason for it. It's because some people are humble and grateful, and ready to submit. And some people are just arrogant, like, like Fir'aun. How many signs came to him, right? Literal miracles. So Allah used one of the miracles to destroy him. And that was the end of him. And he tried to cry out at the end of his life. He tried to say, you know, 
okay, I believe in the God of Moses, and it was too late for him. It was too late. Yeah. He died in that, in that bad state. So subhanAllah, that's what I see, a person who became, sub, so, who submitted to Allah. And that's what everybody should be, because that's, you know, our fitrah. That's how we're created. So I wanted to quickly kind of bring it back to the point. But first, I want to talk about this idea of determinism, which is everything is going to happen the way it is, and it's everything is predetermined, and that's it which you can't deny that everything only happens once. You can't go back in time. Everything's determined, right? But there's also this idea of free will. You cannot deny free will either, right? I feel anyone who says, I only have free will, there's no determinism. This person's kind of illogical, right? And somebody who says there's only determinism, no one has free will. It may be a little more logical, but it's still illogical because we're still consciously choosing what we're doing, right? So one philosopher said that Free will and determinism are two trains that are perfectly in sync and moving perfectly simultaneously together. Like you said, it's programmed no matter what you choose to do. It's so programmed to happen a certain way. Now, with the analogy of building the IKEA bed frame, right? Often in physics and in, in math and in, in any complex uh, language or science, big problems are just a bunch of small problems, right? So think about the bed. You're not taking one half and two half or one half, the other half, and then pushing them together. You're taking all these individual little pieces, little problems, and putting them together. And if that's difficult and that takes six hours and it's physically something you can see, imagine something as complex as life where you can't even see all the implications of it. You cannot even see what's going on in your own self. Even science, to a certain extent, can't see what's going on within your own self. We can only see to a certain point, right? Now think about morals that are unprovable, but yet undeniable at the same time. Mm. How can you, how do you go some, about something like that? You cannot put that together. Therefore you need, and this is why I wanted to tie it back to, you need objective truth if you believe in morality. Otherwise morality is not something that exists to you because you cannot prove it. So I think subhanAllah, we've done an amazing job of just showing how necessary religion, God and objective morality is because without it, what are we? We're honestly, we're no different from animals living by our desires and basically it. Mm -hmm. You guys take it away. No, oh, man, that's, that's actually beautiful. And that's why, you know, that's why in the Quran, we believe that, you know, Allah gave us free will and he didn't, he didn't give the angels free will. That's why if we do good, Alhamdulillah, we're better than the angels because Allah gave the angels <clears throat> intellect in terms of like commandments, but no free will, no instinct. Right. So he gave us, he gave us like both, but Allah gave the angels only commandments, intellect and all that. So who knows if they would have had the instinct or those desires, maybe they wouldn't be all that they are. That's why we would be deemed better than them if we're good people. C compare that to like animals and, and primitive, you know, what you see in nature, Allah gave animals only instinct, only drive, only desire, no intellect. That's why if we're you know, subpar, if we're not on point, we might be worse than the animals because had they have had the intellect and, and the commandments and the true guidance, maybe they'd be better than us. Dude, it's about a law. And I just, I want to add to this, like a lot of people, they might be seeing it and they might think to themselves, well, I, I like God's who he was. Okay. But how do you know if you're being guided? How do you know if you're not being guided? Well, here's the thing. I'm going to go as far as to say that we're all being guided. And it's your choice whether you wake up to that or not. You know, like, I, I am not God. I cannot say, hey, this is your sign. This is what you're supposed to do in your life. But, like, I can say from my own experience that, like, the signs are everywhere. And like in the Quran, it even says like, if you are a believer, you will see the signs everywhere. Look for the signs and you will find them. And that's like, if someone wants to see like, oh, well, how, how can I be guided? Well, just take a step back, bro. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah, bro, SubhanAllah, that's true. That's so true. Uh, there was something I was gonna mention based on that point. It's kind of, kind of set my, my mind now. So if anyone wants to take over, go ahead. But um. I had, a, I had a, again, devil's advocate question for you. I hear this a lot with people that are anti-religion or just irreligious. They ask, 
and they always say that they have this objective sense of morality without God. What do you say to that? Because they're going around saying that, oh, you know, all these things that God is telling you are right and wrong. I already innately feel that, or they claim I subjectively feel that. Why do I need that, God for objective? That is God. If you're feeling something that's directly aligned with like the objective morality, that is God working through you and giving you, like literally giving you that insight mm. because that's not something that you can find yourself. And if you believe it is, then you're ignorant because, bro, how often is our mind going from one thing to the next? Like our mind is constantly changing. Bro, if I talk to you in 10 years, you'll probably be a different fire. Rami will probably be a different Rami. Like y'all will think differently. Now, of course, y'all will still be on the straight path because y'all are Muslim. But if you talk to someone who has, who's completely secular, who's completely, let's say agnostic or completely uh, atheist or new age, whatever it is that they want to say they are, their mind is going to change so much within those 10 years that it's like what was once truth to them 10 years ago is now not truth 10 mm -hmm. years later subhanallah that's true and I imagine we undergo another like scientific revolution where everything like science just flips on itself subhanallah imagine but um that, dude yeah but subhanallah uh what i was gonna say about objective and subjective morality with with all due respect to everybody if any subjective person comes and say i have objective truth because i think this and that they've contradicted themselves, then I don't think any logical person would make that claim. Uh, I believe that if a person actually knows what objective truth or objectivity versus subjectivity is, they would never make such a idiotic statement. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I would say for a person who wants to be guided, because sometimes, you know, I feel this is right. And then I feel that is right. And they could be two contradictory things. So how do you know which one's actually right? Um, or two different people that feel two different things. How do you know who is right? I would say that to a certain extent, yes, Allah put the fitrah in us, but it's not a Qur'an. It is not the Qur'an or the Prophet ﷺ or all of Islam internalized within us. The Prophet ﷺ, Aisha said about him, anha, that his character, who he was, is the Qur'an, period. That's who he was, Sallallahu right? We are not like that. We're not even close to that. And that's fine. So Allah gave us logic and rationality. So if you have something like a religion that is rationally and logically true, and you cannot think of any possible, and not even you cannot think of no one. It's, it's completely incoherent or inconceivable that they would know these things 1400 years ago in the middle of the desert. Or a man that cannot read or write would produce such an amazing book, linguistically speaking, to the point where even today it is still taught in schools as the fundamental basis for the Arabic language, right? Peace be upon him. And he had prophecies and miracles and so on and so forth. Gandhi wrote about him, um, a bunch of people, a bunch of, even Oprah Winfrey talking about Islam, right? A bunch of people talking about this religion, this man named Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 years later. The most, um, uh, the most popular name in the world, right? So on and so forth. If you cannot find a reason to disbelieve in this religion, logically, rationally, it is coherent. It, is, it must be correct. If there is a God, why would he allow another religion that's more true than his? That doesn't make sense. So the most true religion must be from God. So this is how you are guided, by wanting to be guided and by seeking it out, right? Allah, yep. the essence of trusting in God, and this can apply for anybody, but the essence of trusting in God is the hadith where a man came to the prophet, peace be upon him, and he said, do I tie my camel so it doesn't leave or do I trust in Allah? And he said, tie your camel and trust in Allah. Do what you need to do and trust that Allah is going to guide you and help you and have it work out mm -hmm. in the best way. So that's why there are two extremes of just doing what you need to do and saying, I don't, I don't trust God's going to help, like atheists, or the fully spiritual people that are like, God, the universe, whatever, Allah will guide me. I'm not going to do anything. They're going to sit at home in Iraq. Mm -hmm. How is that beneficial? Yeah, yeah. Yo, I'll give you a more applicable uh, application for someone like me who's, who's currently a student. And I know a lot of people watching are, are in school right now and they could relate to this. How, how foolish is it to just, you know, not study and be like, all right, God got my back. Yeah, God got your back, but maybe not always in the way that you want him to have your back. So you can't be out here like, oh, I want to get that 100%. Inshallah, I'll get that 100%. I'll make dua to get that 100% and you not study. Right? And if you just keep studying 
and you just only rely on yourself, there's a lot of things out of your control that you're not going to understand in this domain. Yeah, and that's, bro, that's where, like, it all ties in, where it's like you need the instruction manual. You need the guidelines. You need to let go. You need to let go and let God do his thing because it's, I'm going to put it in a very, very simple example, visual, because I'm a visual person. All right, give me one second. I'm going to flip this camera over. Make some space here. All right, so let's say that that's a straight path. All right. You have Fitra. You understand things because God is giving you that insight. Now, let's say you don't believe in God at all. Let's say, you know what? This is my life. I'm the one that chooses everything that I'm going to do in my life. And that's that, right? This is you. You you may be just sporadically or maybe just out of nowhere. You might have some insight that is directly aligned with the objective morality, with the, with the truth. Right, so you're walking the straight path, but if you do not have instruction manual, if you do not have guidelines, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go off and then maybe, maybe you might make it back. And then if you might make it back, you might be there for just a little bit longer and then oh, you're off again. And who knows, you might never go back to the straight path. And it's as simple as that. And the entire distance that you're doing, you know, you're doing too much, G. Like, it's so much easier to just go straight. Yep. That's a pattern of law. Let's say the, uh, the quickest path is just a straight line, right? It's mm -hmm. a pattern of law. But, um, that, yeah, it's an amazing analogy, man. Mashallah. May Allah bless you. Uh, and I quickly wanted to add in, every time you, you went from the straight path and you diverged off, all I saw was the person who's letting their emotions get in the way. Oh, yeah. Because logically, coherently, they have no reason. Right. Reason is very important. They, like the why. Right. There is no why when it comes to straightening off the path. There's no reason to do it. So mm -hmm. it's only a, an emotional thing. So when people let emotional skepticism, like we talked about, get in the way of, oh, how could, you know, God allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. That's just emotional because you don't know why it happened. You don't know all the implications of it. You don't know the logic behind it. Let's say an entire nation goes through a very difficult time. But that difficult time makes very strong people. And then it actually betters the nation in the long run. Was that necessarily bad? And if you, if you believe it was immoral, you, you'd have to prove that. But again, subjective morality, you wouldn't be able to. But my point is uh, emotional skepticism is, is very detrimental to a lot of people. And living in this age, this is why I wanted to, to talk about this topic. Because living in this age, it's the age of emotional skepticism. Nobody knows why anymore. No, they just kind of feel and then go off those feelings. And the issue with that is many issues, to be honest. Actually, I'm gonna let one of you piggyback off that because I know you guys probably have a lot to say on that. Fire, let me go on real quick. So what you're saying here, actually, dude, Fire, by all means, go ahead. My, my train of thought just completely left me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I had nothing specific to say to that. I was just gonna, once we're done with this, introduce that where are we going with this? Because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, okay, we talked about this. Some some of the demographic there over here, like, okay, I don't believe in God. Um, I believe in whatever I can see, whatever I can guarantee. There's another demographic that's like, okay, I don't believe in God, but I don't not believe in God. And then there's obviously people that are like, okay, I believe in God, but they're almost ignorant. It's almost like you're Muslim by nature or or by name. You're Christian by name. But you never took the time to like question everything. And Allah says in the Quran that, you know, don't just take the religion of your fathers because it was the religion of your fathers. And he's talking to us Muslims too. Like I was Muslim by name, by, by birth, most of my life. But it's not until recently that I became a believer, right? So this is the third category. And then the fourth category is, I would say, not majority of the Muslims. I would say, you know, definitely it's, <clears throat> it's not majority as much as I want it to be, are the ones that truly took the time to like understand that, okay, this is it, why it's it and why there's nothing like that. So again, we're going to talk about, you know, a lot about establishing Islam, um, talking about different religions, you know, here and there um, and in detail in, a, in another episode. But I wanted to get us to establish why God, because we are talking about morality, subjective, objective, but where does God come into this? Why God? Why is there? Why is it necessary to have a God? Oh, bro. 
I think it's super necessary because like we were stating, well, like everything that we've spoken about up until this point, all right, and aside from that, I remember what I was going to say to Rami's question earlier, which I put that aside for now. And if I come back to it, I'll come back to it, inshallah. But sure. everything that we said, bro, you, you can stumble on to the straight path, but how long will you be on that straight path if you don't have any guidelines? That's the real question, right? And that's, that answers the why. That answers the, the question, why God? Why have an instruction manual? Why have the guidelines? It's because everybody wants to be at peace. Everybody wants to live the best life that they can live. Everybody wants to be happy. Everyone wants to bro, just enjoy life. Like, look at little kids. Like, they're all joyful. They're all innocent. They're all just trying to experience life. They're not uh, burdened with everything that we are now that we're coming on to this adulthood. So it's like, bro, that's the answer. If you want the answer, it's very simple. It's right there. The kids have the answer the way that the kids live you know not saying that adults should live like kids because we have responsibilities but just see it for what it is like they're innocent they're pure they're just experiencing life and that is the straight path and that's why that's why you need god that's why you need an instruction manual because if not bro if not, bro, you are just swayed by your emotions. You're swayed by your thoughts. You're swayed by your environment, the people who you hang out with. And like I said, you might be on the straight path, but for how long? Yeah, subhanAllah. That's There's very nothing, true. Nothing wrong with being, you know, having emotions. And, you know, a lot of people are going to come at us and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with having emotions. Without emotions, we wouldn't be who we are. We wouldn't be human beings. Without emotions, we wouldn't have survived because the whole reason, you know, our adaptive, you know, selective value of, of, uh, of emotions was fight or flight, survival or, or not survival, right? So we need emotions today and we needed that once upon a time. There's nothing wrong with that. What's, what's problematic is when we always rely on emotions to lead us in right or wrong, to lead us yeah. in everyday life and make decisions for us. Yeah, because they're temporary. Yeah, subhanAllah. They fluctuate a lot. That's a real issue. Uh, they fluctuate basically every every few minutes, subhanAllah, or every few seconds, actually. So, subhanAllah, very, very good points. I guess to summarize the point you were making on the head, it's kind of like, because we need guidance, basically, right? If we don't have guidance, we don't know where we're going. We're not going the right way. Therefore, yeah. we need guidance. And if it's going to be objectively true, the only one who knows everything is God. So if there, and there's, this is a big if for a lot of people, if there is a proper way to live, if there is guidance, only God can give it to you. That's why God is the only topic of this conversation yeah. uh, when it comes to objective morality. And now for the people that are like, I don't know if God exists. Do you guys want to get into the whole contingency argument, proof, reason for God's existence? Dude, or do you want to save that? No, right, okay, right. Alhamdulillah, that, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, bro. I think that from where we all sit, you know, the three of us, as, as, a trinity, as, a trinity, but as a trinity here's, here's where here's where i think we should go with that i think we should set, set aside a whole separate episode on establishing why islam i want us to talk about briefly other religions yeah. but why you know allah or the islamic god is the god that's that's like another episode this episode let's do what you said let's establish you know briefly in 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 relatively you know sufficient detail why allah or why at least god has to mm -hmm. exist why there can't can't just be you know all of this happening at random yep okay yep. and um just to throw it in there because i know if i don't say it i'm gonna forget it <laughs> but uh, to answer the question you were referring to before about like people doing this this and that but then like you know, later on, like, it's different. You know, they're swayed by the emotions. So like that. The, the thing that I want to share with y'all is, um, y'all know that quote where it's like, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. And, bro, that's, that applies 100% to this, where it's like, the only person who can connect the dots looking forward is the creator. We are just the creation. And right now, we are in the dark. And if no one believes that, or if some people don't believe that, like, 
bro, tell me what happened before you came into this world. Tell me what happened before you were born. Tell me what was going to happen when you die. If you can't answer that, then you are in the dark. And bro, like, if you're in the dark, I know, I know damn well you can't, you don't, you can't distinguish what's, what's straight, what's left, what's right. You're just moving around blind. You just, you can't see anything. And that is, dude, that's what God is, man. God is the light. God is the light that's just going to bring you to the straight path. Like, hey, just go this way. You're, you're, uh, you won't fall on that couch. You won't hit this TV over here. You won't fall into this hole. Um, you won't get this girl pregnant over here and pay uh, child support. Like, you're good. You know what I mean? But it's like, you won't know that if you're trying to do it all on your own. And the thing is, we were never meant to do it on our own. Allah. A very good point, mashallah. It's a great point, mashallah. Yeah. Um, so kind of to, to summarize it, a few questions. Because I want to leave all us, all of us and everyone watching with a few things, inshallah, a few reflective points. Firstly, mm -hmm. I want to ask everyone, why do you live the way you live? All your morals, take every single one of them, or the important ones, right? Abortion, murder, family values, whatever it is, right? Take all of them. And if you believe in a religion, ask yourself, why do I believe in this religion? Even if you're Muslim, ask yourself that and do some research. Inshallah, we'll talk about it in coming episodes. And if you don't have a religion, but you have moral views, which everybody does, prove them to yourself. Prove them to anyone. Prove that your views are correct or that they're right. Because if you can't do this, then why do you believe in it? And we're tying it back to the main question of why. Because everyone knows the who, the what, the where, the when. They don't exactly know why. So why do you believe in what you believe in? How do you know it's true? And if you can't prove that, then you're in a bit of a sticky situation, to, to put it lightly. So, yeah, what yeah. do you guys think about uh, those reflective points there? How would you guys so, summarize those? I would go as far as to say that um, that, is, that is it. That is 100% it. It's like you have to, you have to understand what your why is and, and you can't be emotional about it you got to be able to set your emotions aside because like you know we were talking about this earlier yesterday when we were talking about the cognitive dissonance and we were joking about putting that into the uh <laughs> channel <laughs> intro but that's that's exactly what it is it's cognitive dissonance when when you believe something and it's so ingrained into you but it's it's just something that was given to you. It's something that like you kind of just grew up with. It's not something that you, you sought out for yourself. You seeked it for yourself. It's not something that you would let to. It's just something that was there. It's like, you know, I was born into uh, Catholicism for the most part. And I believed that for a while. I believed that for a while, but it's like, I never went out of my way to question why I believed that. I just believed it. And then, when people started like throwing all these, uh, these, uh, I'd say questions and objections at me, I buckled, I buckled because I didn't, I didn't know why. I didn't know why I was uh, a Catholic. I, all I could say is, well, I, I did it because my parents did it and I just grew up with it. But then it's like, once I started looking for the answers myself, once I put the emotions aside, I said, all right, well, why is it that they said this? Let me look into this. Is this true? Is this not true? And it's like, the more that I went into it, that led me away from subjective morality. And ultimately, it led me to objective morality, but it was a long journey. But not even to get into that, I'm just saying, like, you have to know your why. And you got to be able to put the emotions aside. You do, man. Another good way to put subjective morality for people that still can't grasp it in, in how we are. Uh, holding it relevant to what we're talking about is blind faith. A lot of people just have blind faith and it's just a mission, man. What's, what's, what really gets to me and it, it saddens me is that you have found, you've questioned your religion, you've questioned everything and you've come to see Islam as the truth. But there's a large percentage of Muslim, you know, guys and girls going up. If you ask them period, point blank, why do you believe in, you know, Islam? Oh, it's just because my parents put it on me, you know? That's sad, man. Yeah, subhanAllah. That, that's very true. And it is very unfortunate uh, because if they were to read their own holy scripture, they would find that Allah, like you mentioned before, Allah does not want this for us. Allah doesn't want us to go off blind faith. The fitrah, yes, it's there, but it's only there to a certain extent. What comes after is what 
Allah has provided for us both within ourselves and externally. The signs, the Quran, the Islam as a whole, the Sunnah of the Prophet and our intellect, our rationality, our proper ways of thinking. So subhanAllah, I think it's, it's crucial that everybody, you know, takes a good look at their life and why they live the way they live it. Especially, I'd say, especially if they're Muslim. Because Islam, I would say, is, we would all say is the truth. Objectively is the truth. It's even provable to a certain extent that it's the truth, right? Using different arguments that we'll get into, inshallah, later on. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I think it's highly crucial that everybody takes a good look at their life. I had a point that I wanted to mention, but it kind of set my mind. So why don't you guys take it away? Worries, man. Uh, keep that, keep that thought, thought loop in the back of your head. If it comes back, it comes back, inshallah. Um, let's move forward. So without keeping the viewers waiting, all right, why God? Why is it necessary you know, why believe in God? What is what is proof that God exists? Because, you know, we're living in a, in a society where there's people that are atheists, agnostic, born in different religions. Uh, they're just, they're just, they're drawn at the question, like, why, how do we believe in God? Isn't it such a leap of faith to believe in God? And I invite you guys, um, you know, you guys are going to hear this and it's going to sound, you know, crazy to some of y'all, but it's actually a leap of faith to not believe in God, knowing what we know. And we don't even know something so like out there and, you know, we're, it's like secret or anything like that. No, it's simple, very easy to understand. And inshallah, Rami, why don't you uh, build the foundation for this? Are we talking about the fine tuning? All of it, man. Fine tuning, contingency. Just... Okay. Subhanallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahman ar-Rahman. All right. Bismillah. So <laughs> basically, <clears throat> just to start it off, this is what's called a deductive argument. And a deductive argument is something like one plus one equals two. It uses set premises, general facts that are true, like one being one and one plus one equaling two and so on and so forth. It uses premises that are true and sound logic, proper logic to come to a conclusion. So the, the best example I can give is the one I've been giving, one plus one equals two. That uses premises and logic to come to a conclusion. And this is indisputable. These are just generally accepted facts anywhere you are in the universe. So this, keep in mind throughout this entire discussion that this is the argument that, or this is the formula we're using. So we know that we exist. We know that other things around us exist. And from everything we can observe about the universe, we come to find that it only exists because something before it allows it to exist or something that exists at the same time allows it to exist. For example, without food, nutrition, we cannot exist, right? That's something that exists at our time that we need to exist at the same time. Our parents, without our parents existing, we cannot exist because they are necessary for our existence, but they are not the necessary existence because they also come from somebody else, their parents. They also rely on food and drink and so on and so forth. Now, forget people and animals. Let's look at the planets, the galaxies, or the universe as a whole basic uh, scientific belief, I'll say, because science is kind of belief in a sense, just using uh, induction or evidences, is the Big Bang model, the Big Bang theory, or we basically know the Big Bang happened at this point. And what we find with the Big Bang is that the universe actually came into existence at one point, making everything in the universe also what we would call a possible existence. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. It cut off for a second. So the universe and everything in it is what we would call a you know, possible. I'm just, to, just to pause you right there for people that, yeah. that haven't grasped that yet. Um, just because I don't want anyone to lose this when we when we get the ball rolling and we get that momentum. The universe yeah. has a beginning because it's expanding, and you can't expand out of you know expansion. It needs to have started somewhere. So scientists, cosmologists, in fact, it all started, you know, whatever years ago. And that's the beginning. So the universe had a beginning. That's what we established for sure. Yeah, carry on. Okay, Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you for that. Oh, so, yeah. <clears throat> so yes, what we understand is that the universe had a beginning. It had a point where it started. And that's what the Big Bang is. It just kind of sprung into existence, to use a physicist's terms. It sprung into existence, right? So what we know is that it started at one point. So what caused it to start? Right. And I don't want to get this is not the Kalam cosmological argument that everything that exists has a um, has a beginning, everything or sorry, everything that exists has a cause and, and so on and so forth. Right. So with this argument, again, keep in mind is a deductive argument. So we cannot have 
and keep this in mind, this is the big point. We cannot have an infinite chain, an infinite regression of things coming from other things. For example, your, your mom came from her mom, who came from her mom, who came from her mom. You cannot have an infinite chain of parents giving birth. And the reason for this is, I'll summarize with this analogy. If you wanted to walk to the local coffee shop, you wanted to walk from your place to the local coffee shop, but the distance was an infinite distance, right? You had to walk an infinite amount of distance to get to the coffee shop. How long would it take for you to get to the coffee shop? How long would it take for you to walk across that infinite distance? You would never get there. You would never get there. It would take you an infinite amount of time to get there. So the fact that we exist and we can observe that we exist is proof that it's not an infinite chain going back. It's not an infinite regression, which means that there could be billions of them, but it starts at one point. And this one point must be the opposite of a possible existence. Because if it also comes from something else or exists because of something else, then it's not necessary. It is not the starting point. It starts because of something else. Therefore, there is one beginning. And this beginning must be the opposite of a possible existence. So it must be something that is unlimited. It is not temporary. It is not finite, right? It's infinite. It's unlimited. It's not dependent. It's independent. It does not need anything from anyone. It doesn't need anything from anything. It can exist just by itself, by necessity. It um, is not comprised or built of any smaller parts because if it's built of smaller parts, then it's coming from something. And one of the smaller parts or the smaller part, that would be the necessary existence. So if you look at what we're describing, infinite, independent, uh, self-sufficient, we're basically describing a God-like figure already. And this is a deductive argument. And this is something that's quite indisputable at this point. If you what's what's a deductive argument, bro? For for those of y'all that, that are just wondering. A deductive no, he's, argument. He's just he already explained it, bro. Yeah. But but I'll, I'll, an inductive argument. Inductive yeah, oh inductive yeah, argument. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So an inductive argument is basically this. Every let's say we're talking about sheep, like the animals, every single sheep, right? All of them, every single one I've ever seen in my life has been white. Therefore, every single sheep in the world is white. That's inductive. Until you finally find a brown or black sheep, then you're like, okay, well, most of them are white, but there are a few black. That's induction. And the problem with this is it's based on new information. This is all of science, right? The theory of gravity that Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton had back a long time ago, this changed when new information was brought forth and a new theory was brought forth because of the new information in the time of Einstein, right? But back then, Isaac Newton's idea of gravity was true. That's what people believed. And then upon new information, this happened happening with evolution as well, by the way, even Richard Dawkins, quickly on a side note, because we're speaking, I guess, to atheists here. Richard Dawkins said in, in one of his books, I forgot the title, but he says that the Darwin, uh, Darwinism or Dar Darwinism or Darwinism, sorry. I listen to a lot of UK speakers, they speak off, but Darwinism, he says that the theory of evolution is going to be masked over with a new theory or changed beyond recognition in the few years. I think 2021 is what he mentioned. So even evolution and our understanding of it and the mechanisms and the theories are changing as well. So that cannot be fundamentally true. That's a problem, the problem with induction, but some people would say that's what makes it beautiful, that we don't certainly know anything and it keeps us going. So that's what induction is. So deductive is something that is true no matter what, like one plus one equals two. So we know that everything in the universe, including the universe itself, is possible. Indep or, sorry, it's dependent, it's finite, it's temporary, it comes from something else, it relies on something else, it cannot be the necessary existence. We know that's the first premise. Second premise, we cannot have an infinite regression, an infinite chain going back, because then we would never exist. We do exist, therefore it starts at one point. This one point must be the opposite of a possible existence. Independent, infinite, unlimited, uh, self-sufficient, doesn't need anything from anyone. And we could take it a step further. We could say that this necessary existence, since it does not need anything, but we exist, it decided, it willed that we would exist. Therefore, we exist because it has some kind of will or nature or something of the sort. Something that does not make it dependent, like dependent on its nature or something like that. It, there are certain necessary qualities it has, but it's not dependent or moved by anything. Right now we're describing God even more. We can take it a step further, right? We experience good, we experience bad. Therefore, it has some kind of balance between the two. Not every person experiences good. Not every person experiences only bad. 
but there's a fluctuation. So there is some kind of order. It has this only one with one will and it's not changing because everything, the laws of physics, everything has stayed in motion. And we know this because we have subjectively previous memories. We have uh, even documentation, evidences, proofs that sci um, certain laws have remained consistent throughout history as far back as we could see. And to the point where I could say that if I drop this, it's going to fall based on previous experience and it falls every single time. So from this, we can already, we're already describing God in a nutshell, right? And to bring it to Islam, ultimately, would be the surah, the very beautiful short surah in the Quran, the chapter in the Quran, I believe it's 111, uh, where it says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one, the one and only. Uh, ahad means that there's one without any other, basically. Allahu samad, Allah the self-sufficient. And a samad means the one who does not need anything from anyone, but everything that exists ultimately relies on him. That's what Al-Samid means. So say he's God the one, God the self-sufficient. He does not beget, nor was he begotten. He does not have a biological nature in which he kind of relies on or something where he can give uh, offspring or anything of the matter because that's a byproduct of us, possible existences. Um, God does not have biology. And he does not come from anyone. He does not come from a parent because then the parent would be the necessary existence. It, it omits that um, thought process already. Um, and this is one of the main points. They're all main points, but this is astonishing specifically. And there is nothing in existence. There is nothing that is even comparable to him. Meaning that everything that exists, possible existence, cannot be compared to the necessary existence. SubhanAllah. And this came, what, 1400 years ago from a man who could not read and write in the middle of the desert. Not a philosopher or anything of the matter. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. You can... I challenge everybody to take a look at this and try and criticize it and try and poke holes in it. DM me, DM anybody here if you'd like with your questions or inquiries about it. But this is basically undisputable. Why? Because it's a deductive argument. It's almost like trying to say one plus one does not equal two. And I'm sorry, if you say that, then you're going to have to admit that's mm -hmm. at least incoherent or illogical. So I mm -hmm. hope that was clear. Uh, but yeah, you guys want yeah, to let me, back let, me let me chime in here and say that if any of y'all are going to DM one of us, to ask us questions about that dm rami because i'm still new um i mean you could you could dm fayad as well i'm sure he he has a lot more knowledge and more wisdom than i do on this but even then bro i'm like eons and gleams behind rami when it comes to things like cosmology and you know the theology of islam philosophy he's the one-stop shop like you can come to me and I'll be like, all right, I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll give you the right answer. But Rami has it ready. Mm -hmm. hey guys, if y'all are watching, uh, we have three forms of uh, transmission here. Uh, my base is in the whole secular because I've been in that for a very long time. Rami is in the Islam. And then Fayed is like the bridge between the secular and the Islam because he was born Muslim, so he always had that in his life, but he was also in the secular life uh, because he did not fully believe until recently. So just so you guys know, like when we speak our perspectives, that's where it's coming from. And yes. Do you wanna do you wanna define what secular means or secularism? Uh from what I from what I looked up the other day, because y'all y'all were saying that I, I had come from like a secular place i was like wait what does secular mean i looked it up secular means that you have beliefs and views that aren't uh basically aren't religious or they don't pertain to like a, a certain set principles so it's yeah. like i would even go as far as to say like new age people are secular because they're taking their teachings from a lot of places not just from one place and it's like at the end of the day you can't really do that you can't pick and choose like the yeah. guidelines are the guidelines and it, it took me years to figure that out subhanallah mm, i agree man it's like it's like saying okay i like the steps one to 59 for the bed frame and then right yeah. at step 60 it says you need to use this and put that part there and it's like nah yeah, bro yeah. i like I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that and it's like okay you could do that but at the end of the day you're not gonna get the bed yeah, subhanAllah. And actually, just to use that analogy one more time uh, from myself, let's say you, you couldn't figure out the bed frame. You couldn't get it to work. You as a person, as a purchaser, as a consumer, you just can't get it to work. Who would be 
the absolute, forget the, the instruction manual, who would be the absolute best person to contact about building this bed frame? The creator of the bed frame, am I right? Yes, exactly. The one who made it, he made it. He knows everything about it. He knows the ins and outs. He can probably do it blindfolded because he created it. So if we have questions about life, who would be the best person to contact about that? The one who created life. And Allah, and Allah says in the Quran, he is the one who created death and who created life. He knows yeah. the ins and outs of both because he created them. So if you want to know what, what you should do in life, what the best way to live is, you must go to the creator, the one who made life and death, the one who made you. And if you want to know what, what happens after death, you would have to go to the one who, make, who created death. You cannot ask a, death, a, a, death, a dead person what yeah. death is like. You, know? you, you can try, yeah. but one Dutch shirk and two, you're not going to get a response. SubhanAllah. So you'd have to go to the Quran and the Sunnah. I agree, man. It's too simple to, to just, you know, to believe in, you know, the commandments and the guidance because while, you know, it'll be too chaotic otherwise, you might think, I right, this step tells you to do this. I don't really agree. Another person might agree with it, but kind of, another person might completely agree with it. And then because that person agrees with it, the people they're talking to and the people that trust him, the new age people, whatever you want to say, they'll be like, all right, you know what? That kind of makes sense. I kind of see why that step might not be necessary. Mm -hmm. now you're making a whole new bed it's not even the same yeah thing. yeah it's um you gotta have that trust you gotta you gotta go to dios and that's that's god i mean anyone who's watching this i want y'all to understand like god god can be translated in many different languages as like many different names quote unquote but it's still just one you know it's still just one god and you, you, like I said, you can't you can't pick and choose the guidelines. It's it's already there. You you just have to you got to see it for what it is. For lack of better words, you got to see it for what it is. Alhamdulillah, man. Rami, you have anything else for the the huge gold nugget of wisdom that you dropped on these people? Yeah, that was big. It was big, man, and, and I urge anyone, rewind it once, rewind it a thousand times. If it doesn't make sense, still reach out to one of us, reach out to Rami. Um, but I, 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 I'm confident that it'll make more sense than you guys at least thought it was. And if it sparks up some new ideas, just sit on that, let it, let it, let it marinate, you know, meditate on that and just, just go deeper and don't resist it. Yeah, subhanAllah. One thing I want to mention, it's not really much of an argument. It's just kind of a, a, ref, a reflective thought, right? What do we call the greatest uh, philosophers throughout history? We call them the biggest or the greatest thinkers, right? Because they think, right? And they think about these complex or very um, amazing or enlightening ideas, right? To, to say the least, right? So this, there's no shame in, in thinking or pondering or reflecting or questioning your own beliefs. Actually, think about it like this. This is all science is, right? If you think about it, if you're a believer in science, this is all science is. Science can never prove anything right, but it can prove what's wrong, right? So if you question your own beliefs, you're going to filter out what is wrong, what cannot be right. For example, if you believe there are multiple gods who are both all powerful, this is not something that is possible because neither of them are all powerful if they're both all powerful. What if one overtakes the other? Then it doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. So therefore, deductively speaking, there must only be one who is all powerful. Right. So this this is the essence of pondering, thinking, reflecting, questioning your own views. There's no shame in it. I think all three of us do this all the time. And I feel like everybody does it. Um, it's just a matter of do they actually let it manifest or do they brush it aside and ignore it and become mm -hmm. like those who are deaf, dumb and blind and just choose not to see the signs. Because Allah says in the Quran that, yes, there are signs out in the world that you should go out and see. But there are also signs within your own self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. And I think that's amazing. Dude, like. Man, I keep losing my train of thought. Go ahead, Fayed. No, I have nothing for now. Guys, uh, I'm on this drive and talking too much, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you know what? <laughs> because because we talked about, you know, why God. I'm I'm sure people now, at least if they're not fully there, they they understand that okay, there has to be a God, right? To to believe that, you know, and the fine-tuning argument too, um, which was pretty much the the probability that you know the world and the, the universe the dunya whatever you want to say is the exact same way as it is right now as in to sustain life you know humans whatever you want to say just to be order 
the probability of that was so insignificantly low, so incremental, like I'm talking like it's so small that every other probability wouldn't have deemed, you know, life to exist and what we have today, right? So I'm sure Bobby will explain this in a more comprehensive, you know, easier to digest way, but it's just, there's, there's numbers, like these, these are, physicists have come with these, there's like, I think six different numbers in this formula and they're all like huge. It's, it's like the lottery of the lottery, I kid you not. And the chance of, and it's just this one way of all the numbers to come together. And if it hadn't been this, had it been any other different way, had the lottery drawn out any other number, we wouldn't have life at all. So this is the only number, this is the only way, the only probability that life would have exist. Everything in this dunya would be the way it is. And would you look at that? That's exactly what happened. So just looking at it and before Rami goes, you know, explains it properly, the, the probability of it occurring at random, I'm talking about this number that was the number, the, the, just believing in, in that happening at random, it's foolish. It, it makes no sense. Statistically, uh, mathematically, whatever you want to say, to, to believe that, okay, there was a creator that sought out and it, 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 you know, willed for this to exist and it ordained for it to exist takes less faith than to just believe this happened at random. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, firstly, you did an amazing job of explaining it, mashallah. Um, don't worry. But um, uh, there's not much I can add to that, to be honest. Um, I can give a few examples. Firstly, the, uh, the book, there's an uh, astrophysicist and cosmologist. I forgot his name, but he wrote the book. I think it's titled The Seven or something like that. And it talks about seven very specific numbers that form the universe. And one example that's often given is the number for fusion, which creates, uh, which basically, um, well, I don't want to talk about things I'm not too sure of, but uh, so I'll just say what, what, uh, what I've read. Basically, the number for fusion is 0 0.7 or 0 0.0. Yeah, 0 0.7, uh, as far as I know. And if this number was off by one tenth, if it was 0 0.6, we would not have the universe in the way we have it. And if it was a little too high, 0 0.8, then we would not have hydrogen. And hydrogen makes up, I believe, 70% of everything in the universe and 90% of the atoms. So subhanAllah, this is profound. This is amazing, right? And this is just one number out of seven. So basically what this cosmologist and astrophysicist did is he looked at these numbers and he evaluated them and he wrote a book on it, I believe, titled Seven. But Muhammad Hijabi gave an example of if you were to take a bunch of letters like A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, you take a bunch of them and you put, you cut them up and you put them in a bag and then you shake the bag and then they throw it into the street and the letters fall down in a way that forms one of Shakespeare's plays, right? Like Romeo and Juliet or something. It forms one of Shakespeare's plays. The chances of that happening are more probable or more likely than the chances of the Big Bang happening randomly and we get the perfect, perfect universe we have today. Well, actually, it is perfect. I don't, I don't need to put quotations. The perfect universe we have today and the exact way we have it. That's how in, insignificant the probability is of us having this universe in this way. So essentially what we're getting at is the universe was finely tuned. And this is actually a scientific term. It's called the fine tuning of the universe. The universe was finely tuned to go off in this exact way. So fine tuning or a design, if you will, entails someone who tuned it or something that designed it. So it takes more faith to be an atheist and disbelieve in a designer. Mm -hmm. Then it, it takes more faith to disbelieve in des a designer than to believe in one because the probability speaks for itself. It's so insig I like it's, it's, it's smarter for me to buy one lottery and believe I'm going to win. So imagine putting your life and your afterlife on these low, this, this low probability. I'm sorry. It makes no sense. Yeah, dude, let me, let me piggyback off that. And let me just say that, dude, atheism, because I was in it for a while. Let's be honest. Anyone who is atheist, I don't care what you guys say. You might say otherwise to what I'm about to say. But I was atheist, so I, I know exactly what I'm speaking of here. When you are atheist, you believe in facts. You believe in logic, you believe in science, which is cool. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Rami even said, uh, the Quran tells you to seek the answers. Like, go, go for yourself. Go out there and test it or whatever it is. But it's like science is only going to... Uh, 
assure you of the answer. You see, science is, we'll say, two steps behind, meaning that like once science figures something out, doesn't mean that it just came into existence. It means that it was already there, but now science is like, ah, we can prove that it, it's real, that it exists. So you know what? It may never get to the point where it proves God's existence, but would you would you even need that when it's already starting to prove so many other things that are being shown, are being shown in the instruction manual. And then the last thing that I want to say is that when I was atheist, like, dude, I was not happy. I was the most miserable that I had ever been in my life. And I was seeking through all the external things, some form of happiness, some form of peace, because I remember that I actually became atheist because my, my sister's son, he had passed away at six months old. And, you know, for someone who believed in God at the time and then seeing something like that happen, like I just completely questioned everything. I said, how could, how could you take away uh, a little baby at six months, year, six months old? And everyone's saying that, oh, like there was a reason, there was a reason. Like I couldn't see the reason. So for that, I became atheist. And it's like, yes, I got deep into science. Yes, I got deep into these facts and all these other things. And I, I tried to argue with people who did believe in God and all this stuff. But it's like, at the end of the day, it was, it, it was pointless. It was pointless, you know, to, to put it in very simple words, it was pointless to not believe in God. And it actually took more effort to not believe in God because we all have fitra. We all have that inner belief in the creator every single little kid has fitra and it's like dude every little kid also has a very strong belief in almost anything as well it's like little kids believe in santa claus little kids believe in the easter bunny and it's like dude once you found out that the santa claus and the easter bunny wasn't real because ah, uh, you could definitely see if you you can do the uh the science and all that stuff and show that easter bunny and santa claus aren't real but it's like you can't do that. You can't disprove that God is not real. No, Yo, what do you what do you mean it's not real, bro? What Santa Santa Claus? Yeah, yo, chill, chill, bro. So peep this, all right? Peep this. You get hurt because you find out that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny aren't real. And I know y'all can remember this. I know anyone who's watching this can remember when they were a kid and they found out that Santa Claus wasn't real. Cause I know when I found that out, it's like a part of me was broken, bro. Cause I had been laying cookies out and milk for this <laughs> fat dude for years. And then come to find out he was never coming, bro. It was probably my mom or my dad over here eating the cookies and drinking the milk. <laughs> All right, so once I found that out, I was hurt, but it's like, I got past that. And then what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to like bring with all this is that when you're atheist, it's the equivalent of you being that hurt kid that found out that um, Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny wasn't real. And it's like, you're holding on to this idea. You're holding on to this victim card that no, God is not real. God is not real. When it's like, dude, the signs are all around you. The science doesn't disprove that God is real or not. So like, are you really gonna keep holding on to this card that's making you miserable? that's making you uh, seek happiness and do all these things to so just try to be at ease, try to be at peace. So that's, that's why I'm piggybacking off Rami where it's like, yeah, it, it takes way more to be atheist than it does to be uh, a believer. SubhanAllah. Um, you touched on a really important point there. Um, or a few actually, mashallah, like the, uh, the problem of pain and suffering in the world, right? Because Islamically, we would look at that, you know, six month year old baby and we would say, that, okay, this baby is going to heaven because this baby didn't even reach the point of uh, puberty where, you know, a person's actually starting to get sins for what they do. It's an innocent baby, goes to Jannah, goes to heaven. But uh, to a disbeliever or someone who doesn't have that particular belief, this could cause a lot of issue. And I know with people like Bart Ehrman, who is a scholar of the New Testament. Uh, he has a problem with uh, you know, pain and suffering in the world, and he disbelieves in God for that reason. But the problem with that is, in, in my humble opinion, the problem with that is you don't know all the implications 
of that particular thing to be able to say that it is actually bad. For example,、mm-hmm. if a young child dies and then goes to heaven, is that actually bad? Because what if that child lived a bad life and ended up going to hell? Right? Is that, is that now a good thing for that child to live? And like you can question it you know, until you, until the cows come home, as they say. But like at the end of the day, you never really know the full implications. So, with you, your limited knowledge and your, your bias, it's kind of like you cannot arrive at a, a solid conclusion. And at the end of the、mm-hmm. day, as someone who doesn't believe in God, you have subjective views anyway. So, you can't really say that this is immoral or this is wrong. 100%. And it's like science will always play catch up, but you really want to bet your life, let alone your afterlife, on something that you're not even going to be guaranteed of. It makes no sense to me. And it's like, we're going to get into that later, but everything that the Quran says, there's no contradictions in it. This is the only book of faith where there's zero contradictions. And I challenge any of you guys, if you can find any, which you subjectively feel are contradictions, bring it to us, bring it to anyone. There's answers out there, people, if you're willing to look. But it's the only book of faith where everything that it, it says, Is true. Either I would say 80% of it has been proven to be true, and then like 20 ish percent of it has been proven to neither be true or untrue, but it hasn't been proven yet to be untrue. So therefore, it's not untrue. And ro-、yeah. logically speaking, it's like, bro, 80% is not a bad track record. Yeah, as, as Zachary Nike says,、um, 80% of the Quran is 100% true. Exactly. And the last 20% is ambiguous. So just logically speaking, the last 20% would also be 100% true, following that probability. Man, may, may Allah bless Dr. Dyke, man. That, <laughs> I mean,、yeah. I mean um, Anil, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, let's, let's end it off here, my brothers. Inshallah. First podcast. This went down smoothly. Alhamdulillah. There was actually one more point I wanted to, to make really quickly because I know it's going to be in the back of people's heads. So people are going to be like, okay, so. What, like, okay, I can or can't believe in God, whatever. There's no proof for, or sorry, there's no proof against it. Maybe you have an argument for it, but some people wouldn't consider it proof. And some people are going to ask the very silly question of, okay, well, why don't you believe in unicorns? Right. And they're going to try and make the comparison that, you know, you don't have any proof unicorns don't exist, so on and so forth. But the issue is this is what's called the fallacy of equivocation. You're trying to make equal two things that are just not equal. God being A necessary being for the universe to even exist versus a unicorn, which is the possible existence, Santa Claus, which is a possible existence, so on and so forth. Which actually, Santa Claus had an origin, right? <clears throat> like a, a mythological origin with Krampus and Christmas and all this stuff, pagan, pagan、uh, ideologies and beliefs. So, for any of you who are like, well, I mean, I don't believe in God for the same reason I don't believe in unicorns, it's not the same exact thing. And It's a fallacy of equivocation. But with that being said, Alhamdulillah, I think this was a very, very interesting and productive first episode. So may Allah bless the both of you. Yeah, and for, for the viewers,、uh, this is the first time. And、uh, our quality, you know, inshallah, will get better over time. Video quality, audio quality,、uh, you already know what it is. So if you're liking the stuff, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to like it. Make sure to share it. You know. This is, this is by, and this is the most understatement thing that I can say right now. This is only the beginning, inshallah. Inshallah. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and last thing, last thing, my bad for cutting you off, brother. But the last thing I want to say to people is leave comments. Hit us up, whether it be through the comments, whether it be through DMs. Like, we're here. We may not respond、uh, as quick as possible. I'm sure Rami and Fayad will probably respond to y'all very quickly.、Um, I can't speak too much for myself, but I will respond <laughs> at some point or another.、Uh, but yes, get to us. We're more than happy to interact and、uh, talk about these things with y'all. Yeah, guys. Inshallah. Look forward to、um, future episodes. This so far was why God, you know. It's gonna, we're, we're definitely gonna talk about why Islam, where Islam comes into this. But in the meantime, Rami, brother, and a n a I just had two quick questions for both of y'all. Imagine your life right now. You're, you're exactly the same, nothing's changed except you're not a Muslim. You're not led by God. You don't believe in God. How do you feel right now? What would be different? 
You want me to go first, bro? Yeah, you should. Take it away, bro. So are we referring to like right now at this point in time or are we referring to like years later? Not right now. Right now? Um, I'll probably still be trying to look for something to complete me in a sense, for something to give me the uh, that final piece of the puzzle to make me happy, to make me be at ease, at peace. And, you know, just be lost, bro. Because that's what I was before. I was the definition of lost. Even though if someone looks on my channel and looks at my videos, and even if I look in retrospect and just look at how I used to live and how I used to think and how I used to feel, like, I was lost, bro. I was doing things that helped, but ultimately I was lost trying to find a way. And, you know, alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, man. And where do you see yourself briefly being, I guess, led to? Or just leading yourself? Uh, I don't know, man. Only only God knows. And like I said, we we can't connect the dots looking forward. We can only connect them looking backwards. The only one that can connect them looking forward, you know who it is. I like that. Rami, mm -hmm. about you? Well, man, honestly, I don't even know if I should answer that question. <laughs> Being completely honest. But, um, yeah, it's, man. I mean, it really depends. Not If I wasn't a Muslim, dang, man. Either one, I might still be with my ex or I might be with someone else if I'm, this is this is why I didn't want to answer this because honestly if I'm being completely honest I might not have even been here at this point honestly because once like back you know you guys know what what I've been through and stuff there's a really really dark time in my life where I just didn't want to live anymore and the, like I'm the only reason I, I stopped it in my own head these thoughts of you know I never really told myself I want to kill myself but I kept telling myself I I just, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I want to die. I just want it to happen. But because I was a Muslim, I, I, I had to stop it there because we all know if you kill yourself, then like that, you go to hell. And um, believing in Allah provided a lot of comfort for me, you know, alhamdulillah. And it didn't just give me a reason not to kill myself, but actually gave me a reason to keep living specifically, right? Because you could be alive but not living. That's why, you know, I decided to go back to school and to apply to university and to change my career and all this stuff, alhamdulillah. That's why I actually, I started this podcast with you guys. Um, so honestly, a part of me wants to say that if I didn't have a lot, if I wasn't Muslim, I probably would have just off myself right there. Mm. That would have been a, about a year ago, subhanAllah. So, alhamdulillah for Islam. Yeah, alhamdulillah, <laughs> man. That, that did not happen. Bro, ultimately, I'm sure I want to I wanna know where you would be as well if I had. So, before I even say anything, why don't you let us know where you'd be? All right, bro. Uh, if I wasn't Muslim... I say I think I would be 10 times more lost than I was when I was a Muslim, but not a believer. In that I would be, I wouldn't even know what objective morality is. I'd be, you know, growing up in a society where my family doesn't have these values, which now I know are right, you know, most of them, but I'd be, I'd be going around, you know, believing in Santa Claus and just living in lies and not being liberated, not being free. But man, I think that pain is less. Because the greatest problem you can have is not knowing you got a problem to begin with. Me becoming a Muslim, as, as like being born a Muslim, but not being a believer, bro, that stage was worse. Because it's almost like I'm living in this, like, y'all watch The Matrix, right? So it's almost like mm -hmm. I'm living in this blue pill world where mm -hmm. I don't know what's real. I don't know what's not real. Any, anything I do which aligns with the, any, like, red pill truth, which in the, in, if you watch The Matrix, that's, like, the real, it's painful, but it's real. So... When I was in that stage, it's like anything good I do, which aligns with Allah, aligns with Islam, aligns with whatever, would be maybe like just by chance. I wasn't doing it because I knew it was right or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything I did wrong was obviously out of my ignorance and, again, me not being led. But it's like once you once you wake up and see life for what it is and see, you know, reality is, you know, the truth, you make informed decisions. So I'd be doing the opposite of that if I was lost. And mm -hmm. the peace I have now I can't, I can't explain it. I can't compare it to anything else. But Allah guides who he was, man. And inshallah, all we can do is just keep praying that Allah keep guiding us. Thanks. And I'm sure y'all, all of y'all can agree that if, if it wasn't for Islam, if it wasn't for Allah guiding us, 
we'd all be cucks. Like we, we would all be cucked by something in our life, whether that be our woman, whether that be our job, whether that be uh, some random person on the street that just really makes us pissed off that day or something like that. But it's like, we got to understand that we, we submit to something at some point or another. And it's like, if you submit to God, like God's not going to cuck you. God's not going to cuck you. So if you're not, if you're not going to submit to God, whatever else you do submit to guaranteed is going to cuck you. I agree. Man. A lot. But yeah. What are we going to say? Me? No, I uh, know. Oh, Cause you said, I'm going to let you at, uh, answer your question first. That's that's what I was gonna say. Okay. Yeah, a lot. Um, as they say, everyone's a slave to something, and the only way to truly be free is to be a slave to the one who created you, and the one who will can, who can who's all, the only one who's capable of loving you perfectly, giving you what you need, sustaining you, so on and so forth. The one with no bias, the one with all the information. Alhamdulillah. If you're a slave to your own desires, I wish you the best. If you're a slave to another person, I wish you the best. If you're a slave to money, uh, music whatever it is, I wish you all the best because that is probably, in my opinion, not the path you want to be taking because that will lead you to unprecedented areas and that will lead you just on ultimately to depression because you're going to be trying to find gratification in little things temporarily and then long-term, it's going to cook you. Transient things that are, that are just going Boom. to Boom. Be great. I agree. Yeah, Boom, kind of that long. right there, podcast number two. Y'all be on the lookout for that one. In the oh, meantime, no. once you guys put down your popcorn, you guys like this video, you guys hit subscribe, you guys look at our comments, maybe find our socials, hit us up for any questions. What do you guys think they should do in the meantime? What do you think they should think about in the meantime? Hmm. Oh, honestly, I would say just reflect on your views, your values, your beliefs. See if they are logically coherent and question what you believe to begin with and try and empty the, your glass, so to speak, as much as you can. And then revisit these points. Even we rewatch some parts of the podcast and try and just reflect on them. Do they make sense to you? Do you have any reason, <clears throat> pardon me, do you have any reason not to believe in these things? Mm-hmm. And yeah. just reflect as a person. Everybody has their own journey, right? No, I don't, I don't believe anybody's going to watch this. But like, okay, well, I'm Muslim now, right? It's a process Thanks. for everyone. And there's no mm-hmm. shame in taking you know, the time you need taking too much time. There is shame in that. Um, if you don't need it and you're wasting time, there is shame in that, but taking the time you need is perfectly okay. Mm-hmm. That's all I have to say on that. We're, we're very, that. we're very, we identify with our egos. Our ego is our identity of who we are. It's so much easier to keep identifying with it because we, we as human beings, we, we run towards pleasure and we run away from pain. So we're not going to like sitting back and it's, it's one thing guys hearing what we're saying here and, and being like, okay, cool uh whatever like and then close your laptop go on <laughs> it's another thing truly taking like forget an hour even 10 minutes before yourself before bed just like sitting in bed not some crazy crazy ish like you know light up a candle and then sit in like some meditation position i'm not saying that i'm saying just close your eyes really reflect really think like is what you're doing logical is what you're doing true to your nature is what you're doing even in by your highest definitions of subjectivity is it right? Is it purposeful? Is it resourceful? Is it taking you anywhere? Are you really happy? These are not easy questions and it's not, not supposed to be because having a paradigm shift or an ego death or whatever you want to call it to like strip away your identity and form a new identity, it's not easy. Like a caterpillar doesn't just turn into a butterfly. It has to go through all of those whatever life stages that y'all learned in, in school. It doesn't just- The cocoon. The cocoon, bro. And it doesn't just turn from that to like a butterfly. It doesn't just, mm-hmm. the wings don't just come out. It's a stage. A lot of people might be scared. Like what, what is happening? I used to look like a caterpillar. Now I'm turning, this whole thing is forming. What is that? You know, and it, it, I think that parable is very similar to, to us, paradoxical, but it's like those in that cocoon, what do they see from the inside? Just a shell. Like they're just, they're just going to resist everything. They're just going to resist change. They're going to resist all these new ideas coming in. They're going to be like, no, nah, man, like, I don't see it. I can't see it. Because from inside the cocoon, you can't see it. you got to break through. you got to become that butterfly. Yep. It's going to hurt. Yeah. It's going to hurt. But you got to go through it. It's like we were talking about the cognitive dissonance. 
you got to be able to disassociate yourself from your emotions, from your ego. See it for what it is. Don't try to uh, push it down, but just don't get controlled by it. If not, you're just going to stay stuck in a cycle and you'll never get to the truth because you're letting your emotions dominate you. And because you don't want to feel that suffering and that pain to get to the truth, you're essentially taking the blue pill. And you already know you have two options. You can take the red pill or you can take the blue pill. It's all up to you. Like there's there's no there's no right or wrong, but you reap what you sow. You're gonna be responsible. And the blue pill, I'm no one's denying it, guys, and we're gonna leave you with this. It is the easy way out. Where let's not let's not get it twisted. Like it will make you, I guess it'll go down easier, it'll help you sleep at night, it'll come for you, it'll tell you everything you want to know. It will literally reassure all the beliefs you have right now. But you can you're living in a fairy tale, it's not real. The red pill, though, it's hard. It's you know, short term, it's going to be brutal, but long term, life's going to get so easy and so peaceful. With the blue pill, short term, it'll give you comfort and ease, but long term, it's going to give you this ease. So yeah. it's all up to yeah. you. SubhanAllah. All right. With that being said, I think that was a very, very productive episode. Alhamdulillah. I think that was an amazing way to end it. So to all you watching, may Allah bless you all. I encourage you all to think deeply on this and ponder and reflect on it. Take your time. You know, we're all... You know, just regular people like you guys, we're all, we've all been through it, right? We're going through it along with you guys. So I ask that you don't see any of us uh, in any other light other than we're just your peers and your brothers. So may Allah bless you all. I mean, and share this video because if you found it resourceful, here's the thing. You guys found our video somehow. I don't know if it was through y'all were following one of us or maybe you found it on YouTube, you stumbled upon it, but it, it didn't just happen. You, you found it for a reason and maybe somebody else might benefit from it too. So share it with them, watch it together, who knows, and look forward to episode two.